Welcome to the second session of this Liberation War Museum Global Virtual Conference on commemorating past genocides and learning to prevent atrocity crimes. So I'm Manzirul Haq, moderating this session from Japan. In the second session, we are focusing on East Asia, precisely on three countries, Japan, South Korea, and China. Our three distinguished speakers will be talking about some historical aspects of these countries that are linked to genocide and massacre with the aim of broadening our understanding about our prevention of atrocity crimes. So East Asia these days is not directly under threat of massacre or genocide. Problem for the region is more about denial of past genocide and hence, Learning about the past is important for the current generation and our posterity for preventing the repetition of what happened in the past. And all our three speakers are actively involved in disseminating that information. So we'll move over to Q&A session after three speakers finish making their presentation, except for Gayum because she needs to leave earlier. So for her, in her case, Immediately after she finishes, question and answer. If there's any any anybody, any of the participants would like to ask a question, you can you can ask. Uh, so first, I would like to uh, uh, invite Kayun Beck, who is a distinguished personality from the Republican Korea, the Republic of Korea, to make his make her presentation. She is joining us from Seoul. And Ms. Beck is currently serving as Chief Secretary of Truth and Reconciliation Commission of the Republic of Korea. She obtained her MSc in Human Rights from London School of Economics and Political Science, and later went to the University of Warwick. In the past, she worked in various capacities as coordinator of Peace and International Solidarity Team of People's Solidarity for participatory democracy, as well as East Asia Program Officer of Asian Forum for Human Rights and Development. In her presentation, uh, Ms. Gainbeck will give an overview of the Jeju April 3rd uprising and massacre, which happened between March 1947 and September 1954 in Jeju Island of South Korea when islanders courageously stood up against the di division of the country. So I welcome Gayon Beck to make her presentation. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, nice to meet you all. My name is Gayon, um, and I'm quite delighted to, to be invited to this conference to have, make a presentation about the Jeju April 3rd uprising and massacre. Um, as the Munzer has uh, mentioned, this Incident happened almost 70 years ago, and it happened for seven years and seven months, from 1947, March 1st, to 1954, September 21. So it's quite complicated to explain all the details in 15-minute presentation, but I'll try to do my best to uh, summarize you about the event, the, the explain to you about the incident, as well as what is the main point and concerns the civil society has on this issue. Uh, let me share my, oh, can you, Give me the function that I can share my screen so that I can share my presentation. Now it's blocked here. Share screen, do you have? Yes, I need to share uh, my screen, my presentation file with the participant, but I cannot do that one. Can you give me the function? It has been disabled. Yes. Can you I'm, I'm sorry, I'm leaving it on the machine. Can you please? Yes, I'm giving the permission. Yeah, now, now you can, I think. Okay, still not working. Still not working. Yep. Is it okay now? Nope. If you open your screen um, on your on your thing, and then at the bottom left, no. uh, you, I you click the see... share the screen at the bottom. Screen, but, but but the host is yes. disabled. Yes, deactivated the sharing of the. Now you can make it. Let me try again. Nope. Hello, host. Oh, okay. 
Okay, now I'm uh, the you, host. You're the host. Now you're the host. Yeah. Now yeah, I can okay. get, I can do. Yeah, yeah. Now, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> because it happened seven years and seven months ago, uh, 70 years ago, uh, we don't have uh, detailed photos of during that time. So I'm going to use a paintings by Kang Yo Bae, who actually painted the whole scenes, each scene of the major event of this April 3rd uprising and massacre. As many of you are well aware, Korea was under uh, colonization of Japanese colonization for 35 years. And in 1945, Korea was finally liberated from the Japan and everybody was came out on the street and they dreamed about what kind of countries that they want to make after the whole long year of the, um, the colonization. But as, as you see, that was the beginning of the Cold War and also the superpowers in the world wanted to actually discuss how they're going to deal with this Korean peninsula, which is just deliberated from the uh, Japanese government. Right after the liberation, as you can see, the Korean people were full of hope and they discussed about what kind of countries that they want to make, whether they want to build a socialist country, democratic country, um, how they're going to have people power to build the new country as well. They were full of hope and full of um, the, the, the joy uh, on discussing how we are going to make the, uh, the country with our own hand. So at the local level, the villagers made a people's committee and then they independently discussed about what kind of country that we want to build. The interesting thing is at that time, there was a survey targeting the Korean Peninsula people asking that, them what kind of country that do you want to make? And that was 1945, 1946. Surprisingly, 70% of the population say that they want to build a socialist country, while 20, 25% of the population replied that they want to have a democratic country. So from current perspective, well, we wonder why they want to have a socialist country. But then when you go back to those days, 70 years ago, all those young intellectuals in Korea, they dreamed about this country where everybody can live equal. So when they heard the result of the survey, the Soviet Union at the time was like, OK, we can leave this country as it is while um, while the U.S. government says that, no, 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 we cannot leave uh, this country like this, because if we leave like this, then the whole country, oh, sorry, the whole country is going to become the socialist country. There was a long debate, debate between the Soviet Union and the U.S. on how we are going to deal with this Korean Peninsula. And at the Moscow conference, they finally decided that they are going to have five years of trusteeship. Um, and then the Soviet, will, Soviet Union will dominate the North while the US military government will dominate the South. So in the South part of Korea, the police, um, the US military government started to dominate and control the South Korean, the South part of Southern part of Korean peninsula. And then the police officers were also deployed under the US military government. The interesting thing is when the US military government first came to the South, instead of considering what Korean people really want, what they want is that they discussed as to how we are going to dominate this whole country. So um, when they rehire, when they hire the government officers under the US military government, instead of choosing those people who actively joining the people's committee, they actually hired those people who know the system, who are the Japanese collaborators during the Japanese colonization. So people started to wonder why, you know, it seems like that we are liberated from the Japanese colonization, seems like the new world has opened, but why? Why it's the same police officers, same government officers under the US military government, especially the police officers who were the collaborators of the Japanese colonization, they were the ones who actually tortured, arrested the independent movement activists. They were actually having the same title with the police badge under the US military government. So people started to wonder, you know, the new world has come, but something is wrong. So in 1947, in, on March 1st, the, uh, the people wanted to celebrate the independence uh, the huge independence movement. It was already after the independence, but they want to have a big gathering. And in Jeju Island, which is the southern part of Korea, the, the small island, they, there were also the big protest 
um, on the street on the day. And the main slogan is that we want to have a unified country because people were worried that the Korea is going to divide it into two since the Soviet Union occupied the North and then the US military government will occupy the South. And then they say that they don't want the trusteeship. They say that we want to have our own country with our own hand. Unfortunately, while people gather together on the street, um, they say that around 30,000 people gathered on one side. One little boy was wandering around the protesters and then by accident, he was hit by the Mount Police, uh, Mount police horse. The, you can see the, 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 the police is riding a horse on the left. And then because the horse kicked the baby, the police didn't know, so he just walked away. But as I mentioned to you, people already have this outraged feelings against the police officers because they were used to be the Japanese collaborator. So people were angry that the police didn't come down and say sorry to this baby. So they followed him, shouting at him, saying that, you know, come down and apologize, come down and apologize. But then he was scared that the crowds are following after him. So he ran towards the police station. And then unfortunately, the police officers at the police station shoot guns against the crowds and then six people were killed and the eight people were injured. We say that this is a beginning of the April 3rd. The April 3rd uprising actually happens a year later in 1948, but this shooting incident of 1947 is a key trigger that lead to the 1948 uprising that actually brings anger to people's mind. Since um, six people were killed and eight people were injured, um, people went on a general strike um, like 10 days later. And then the whole Jeju Islanders, almost 95% of the whole Jeju Islanders joined the general strike. And their main call is like this, investigate the incident properly, independently, um, end, end the impunity, punish the perpetrator properly, and also prevent the reoccurrence of the incident. Unfortunately, the US military government did not listen to people's urge and they started to arrest the people who joined the protest and then just put them, detain them in the prison. At that time, the Jeju population, the whole population was 300,000. But then for a year, 2,500 Jeju Islanders were detained in the prison as well. Unfortunately, during that time, uh, while people were detained in the prison, three people, including two students, were tortured to death by the police officers. So as you see for a year, like people were full of hope, joy of independent, but then suddenly the superpowers came in and they wanted to divide the country into two. And then people were wondering like what's going on. They went on the street, but then those people who want the freedom of the independence of the country were detained in the, in the prison and six people were killed by shooting. Three people were tortured to death. And it was obvious that young people of Jeju Island decided to raise arms against the government. So a year later of the shooting incident in 1948, uh, on April 3rd, the armed resistance group decided to raise arms against the government. That was the beginning of the April 3rd uprising and massacre. The slogan was actually quite clear when they rose arms against the government. They say that no more police brutality and no South Korean only election, no division of the country, because there was a mood that the country is going to divide it into two. They also say that there is no choice between sit and kill, but then we can only do stand up and fight. That was the main slogan. Unfortunately, the US military government and then the, the Korea government was not established at that time. So that was still under the US military government. Um, they severely can cracked please, down. Hurry, so we are, Sorry? We are probably overshooting the time. Can you just very oh. quickly? <laughs> oh, so sh should I speak slower? No, no, no. You're you're overshooting your time, allocated time. Oh, yes. oh really? So should Almost I shorten coming? it? Oh, no, I'll, 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 one, one more minute left. So if you can hurry. Okay, I'll just shorten it then. So, yes, yes, yeah. You short, shorten it because already we are now in, uh, now in 1250. Okay, I got it. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so because of that one, people were um, the almost the ten percent of the Jeju population were killed by the uh, by the government forces at the time, and then we say that almost thirty thousand people 
out of 300,000 were killed at the time. It was the largest number apart from the Korean War that the civilians were killed in the modern history of Korean um, history. Um, seven years, the seven years almost uh, passed after the Jeju April 3rd uprising and massacre. Fortunately, in 2000, the special act on discovering the truth of the Jeju April 3rd incident was enacted. So the government actually had the national level of investigation um, to investigate about the April 3rd. And then in 2003, the investigation report was released and then the then president actually made an official apology to Jeju Islanders. But still there are things to be more investigated including the US involvement to this killing. And also the bereaved families are calling for more investigation and also the reparation from the government as well. Um, and also when we talk about how we are going to remember the Jeju April 3rd, we also want to see the steps of truth, justice, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence and memory as well. And then to remember the Jeju April 3rd, I always believe that we need to go beyond Jeju and stand in solidarity with other state violence victims, including what's happening in now in Asia and other parts of the world. So the Jeju April 3rd uprising, the spirit can be maintained and stand in solidarity with other victims of the state violence as well. Um, it was a really brief and short presentation from my side, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gayon. Thank you. And, and as I mentioned earlier, because she is, she is supposed to leave early, so if there's any question, you can just among, among our participants, if there's any question, you can write it in Q&A. Or if you have question later, she will be answering by email. So Asif Saifuddin, I have a question to prove it. Uh, Professor Hiteki will, will make his presentation later, Uyamura-san. So your question will be... Uh, yeah, uh, will oh, be sorry. Later. later. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gayon. So you, if, you, if you are in a hurry, so you can leave now and or, or you can stay a little bit before you... Uh, uh, before, uh, uh, before you think that you... You, your time is approaching. So now, next, our next speaker is Professor Hideaki Uemura. Yeah. <laughs> he'll make a part and presentation on post-World War II massacre in Okinawa. Yeah. He's professor so and they, now let me introduce you a briefly. briefly you, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's Thank professor and dean of graduate school of mm. uh, peace, uh, graduate school of peace studies at Keisen University. And Professor Uemura specializes on international human rights laws of indigenous people, colonialism and decolonization studies, as well as activities of NGOs in the field of peace and human rights. Professor Uemura uh, has obtained his MA in economics from the Graduate School of Economics of Waseda University. And besides being a full-time professor at Kaysen University, Professor Wemura made valuable contribution in NGO activities, including serving as international member of the International Commission of Chittagong Hill Traps of Bangladesh, yeah, right. 2008 to 2011. His presentation is on massacre of many Okinawan civilians by the Japanese army, as well as by American occupation forces in 1945, the aftermath of which continues till these days. Yes, please, Professor Wemura. Yeah, uh, Monsri, uh, can I share my uh, PowerPoint slide? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, organizer. Can you can you make Professor Uemura now host so that he can share PowerPoint presentation? What's I said? I cannot. Yes, you, you can share this. Now I, I think you can. You have been made made host. Can you can you share screen? Sorry. Okay, it's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Wait. Mm. At, at the middle of your screen, it's a yellow thing in the middle at the bottom. The green thing know. at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know, sorry. Okay, I know. Okay, okay. sorry. It's okay, you can see. Uh, it's coming, my... it's coming. Yeah, yeah. it's hard yeah. time. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, my name is uh, Uemura and uh, uh, old friend of uh, Oa Sensei and a uh, uh, researcher at the, at the same time, the uh, activist uh, of human rights. So we uh, today, uh, I will talk uh, to all of you about the massacres of Ryukyuans Ryuk in 1945 and after mass. They, you know, the uh, uh, Ryukyu oh, Islands is here. Uh, this is uh, Japanese uh, archipelago and Taiwan Islands and the Chinese uh, co continents and the Korean Peninsula. The uh, Ryukyu locates in the Pacific Ocean, uh, islands, nations, islands, nation. The, so, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce some uh, term to related to the people in the Ryukyu chain. Uh, the Okinawa uh, is... Uh, Probably you know the name of Okinawa. Okinawa is a prefecture's name, and uh, right now the Japanese government often use this one. So uh, Japanese government named the uh, islands and the people uh, as Okinawa, but the old name is Ryukyu. Ryukyu. Uh, Ryukyu. Uh, uh, the people of. Uh, Present Okinawa Island uh, Islands uh, had uh, small nation, uh, small kingdom, uh, whose name is uh, Ryukyu, Ryukyu or Ryukyu. And uh, so we, uh, I am a uh, dominant and majority Japanese. The, this people's name is Yamato Japanese, Yamato Japanese. So uh, you know the. Uh, Japan is a Jap Japanese country, but Japanese uh, includes the uh, Ryukyuans, Okinawans, or uh, uh, Yamato Japanese, and etc. etc. Mm. First of all, uh, for your uh, reference, this is uh, some picture uh, about the Ryukyu Kingdom. Uh, this is the uh, old castle, uh, the Shuri Castle. Uh, this uh, uh, building. Uh, uh, style is uh, close to the Chinese one, uh, not Japanese. And uh, you could, uh, traditional dance is like this. And the back background and prehistory of the massacres, uh, the 1879, the Ryukyu Kingdom was annexed to Japan by uh, military forces. Uh, this is the uh, picture. The Ryukyu or uh, Shuri Shrine of the capital of the Ryukyu Kingdom was occupied by Japanese military, like this. So uh, after that, the Ryukyu Kingdom was named Okinawa Prefecture and became uh, part of Imperial Japan's mainland. And Ryukyu and Okinawan people had been regarded that they are second-class citizens, second-class citizens, because uh, they have different culture, different history, and different language from Yama Japanese. Uh, and uh, so Japanese uh, government of Japanese uh, stress that the Okinawans uh, have no loyalty no loyalty to emperor or emperor system. So the Japanese government uh, introduced uh, a forced assimilation policy uh, to deny the cultural tradition and language uh, under the name of modernization. So uh, Japanese government thought the Okinawan people uh, was a, a primitive one, primitive one. So Japanese government must uh, modernize them uh, to good, good, uh, good citizen. Since then, the Ryukyu and Okinawan people have been long discrimination, uh, uh, long discriminated by the Japanese government and the Yamato people. So, in in this history, the bloody battle of Okinawa was happened in 1945. So uh, the battles uh, date uh, from uh, March 26 uh, to June uh, 23. Uh, this is an official one. Uh, but uh, uh, real battle uh, 
actually ceased uh, at the 7th September 1945. The so uh, uh, causalities uh, in the battle, the Japanese uh, uh, eight, uh, 188, uh, one, uh, uh, 136. The Americans were allied power soldiers, uh, 12,000. And uh, including them, including the Japanese, uh, the Okinawan Ryukyuans, uh, 122,000. Uh, at, at the same time, the civilians are uh, 94,000, about 94,000. So uh, many uh, Okinawan civilians were killed by Japanese and Americans uh, in the battlefield. The cause of uh, civilians' deaths, uh, I uh, pointed out the five, five. The first, uh, they postponed the evacuation plan for civilians. So as you may know, uh, the uh, Japanese government uh, priority is the military, uh, military use or military plan or military, etc., etc. The so uh, evacuation plan for uh, civilians uh, were uh, postponed. And uh, the evacuation plan was uh, sloppy, sloppy. Uh, this, uh, like this, uh, the, in the northern part of Okinawa Island is uh, uh, con um, a little bit uh, safer uh, zone in Okinawa Island. Uh, but the, uh, from south uh, to north uh, parts of Okinawa is very uh, difficult. Uh, so, uh, but the uh, Japanese government forced to, the civilians to move by themselves. The second, uh, third one uh, is the civil civilians were mobilized as paramilitary personnel uh, to build uh, a tunnel. Uh, Japanese uh, armies uh, made uh, a lots of tunnel in the mountain area. The so uh, the Okinawa civilians uh, mobilized uh, to help uh, Japanese army. And the force uh, discriminated by Yamato Japanese. Uh, as I said before, uh, so for a long uh, time, uh, uh, Japanese uh, discriminated the Okinawan people. They saw uh, Japanese soldiers uh, killed. Uh, so not not small part, uh, not small number of uh, Okinawans by themselves. This, for example, uh, the. Uh, Okinawan people have a uh, different language. Uh, at, at the time, the, uh, also the Okinawan people uh, uh, talk, talked to uh, each other. The, so the uh, cont uh, contents of the speech or the uh, talking is not uh, understandable. Uh, is uh, understandable for Japanese. The so Japanese soldiers, uh, what uh, did you, what do you say? Uh, you are the spies of America. Americans, uh, they saw uh, Japanese soldiers killed Okinawan civilians easily. They saw uh, the Battle of Okinawa is uh, uh, so, uh, tragic or the uh, very uh, so a big, big, big battle or in the uh, World War II in uh, in the Pacific uh, Asian Pacific area. So after World War II, Okinawa was, uh, what happened uh, to Okinawa? World War II, uh, Okinawa was uh, separated from Japan in 1945 uh, by the United States. The US military uh, ruled Okinawa directly. Uh, that means the uh, US military governments uh, ruled Okinawa. So uh, not, not US government, uh, US military government uh, Lud Okinawa. Therefore, the, they uh, disrespected the human rights of Okinawans. And uh, 1972, Okinawa returned to Japan. The Japanese government uh, uh, prioritized the U.S. military uh, by uh, Japan-U.S. Security Treaty. Uh, the, under the US, uh, Japan-U.S. Security Treaty, uh, U.S. military bases and facilities concentrated exclusively on Okinawa. The Okinawa covers only 0.6% uh, of Japan. Uh, however, 73.8% uh, uh, of US exclusive bases in Japan exist in Okinawa. 
Right now, uh, the new base uh, building uh, is ongoing. The arts, uh, especially the Henoko base is a very famous one, the east coast of Okinawa Islands. So uh, to, uh, 2018, uh, started to take soil, the uh, reclaimed side of the base. Uh, uh, last year, uh, 2020, the Japanese government planned to use soil that contained wooded, wooded uh, in, in the uh, south part of uh, Okinawa Islands uh, to build the Henoko base. So it's a very uh, un unethical or the, uh, so un incredible uh, plan for the, the Okinawans, uh, Okinawan people. The so uh, new struggles uh, for human rights and, and in, in, in particular the rights of indigenous peoples from 1990s. The so uh, many uh, some many groups uh, established in Okinawa Islands uh, like this. Uh, the so uh, to 2015 September, the governor Onaga uh, Takeshi Onaga visited Geneva and made a speech at the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, so Japanese government neglected the uh, Okinawan people's rights uh, and self-determination. Uh, uh, here's uh, uh, Governor Onaga at Geneva. Yeah. Then in conclusion, uh, learn to learn the lessons. Uh, it is very, I think it is very important. The, uh, sharing history among all peoples uh, concerned. Uh, the, um, so Okinawa, uh, Okinawa uh, our Ryukyu, Ryukyuan history uh, is uh, ignored for a long time. Uh, even from the uh, Ryukyuan people, Okinawan people. At the same time, the Japanese don't know the uh, Ryukyuan history or Okinawan history uh, exactly. For example, uh, probably uh, our sensei don't know the history of Okinawa. Oh. Uh, he's very uh, sensitive, uh, 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 so famous and very good old, uh, professor, but even him, uh, he, he, he didn't know uh, the Okinawa history and culture. The, so uh, promoting peace and non-violence education is uh, needed. Uh, to all, all uh, people concerned. Uh, the third one is uh, promoting human rights education uh, also uh, lacks in uh, Japanese people. Yeah, so uh, the force, uh, the having a clear message on their own rights to deliver. The, so uh, right now the, in, uh, in Okinawa, the many uh, young people uh, would like to uh, learn and study the rights of the contents of the rights of uh, indigenous peoples and how to appeal to whom the international community and uh, US uh, citizens or US governments or Japanese government or Japanese people. So uh, they are so struggling uh, for uh, confirming uh, their, their insist, uh, insistation. Uh, okay, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to me. It's okay? okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Uemura. So uh, before I move over to Dr. O'Connor, there is one question specifically yeah. directed to Professor Uemura from Asif Saifuddin. Uh, what was the reaction of the international community? I guess this is the massacre of Okinawan people. Yeah, uh, so before the uh, 1990s, uh, the, so Okinawan people uh, appealed to only the Japanese. Uh, the Okinawa prefectures people discriminated by the mainland people. The, so their uh, message is not internationalized. So uh, from 1990s, uh, they uh, started to appeal uh, his, uh, their message to the uh, international uh, society, for example, uh, using the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. The uh, movement is uh, started uh, just uh, about 10 or 20 uh, years ago. 
Mm. Not, I think it is not so enough. Mm. And okay. also, there are two other questions. Those, those I'll, I'll be coming back later after finishing Dr. O'Connor's presentation. Maybe there will be other questions to Dr. O'Connor also. So together, I'll, I'll, I'll come on because otherwise we might run short of time. So finally, we have another of our distinguished speaker, Dr. Peter O'Connor. Yeah. Dr. O'Connor is an emeritus professor of Musashino University, uh, Tokyo, and a historian of the transnational media of East, South, and Southeast Asia in the modern period, with a PhD from SOAS, London University, on monograph about the English language press networks of East Asia, 1918-1945. He's also a leading expert of English language journalism in East Asia and authored a number of books on this and other subjects. His presentation, Credibility, National Integrity, and War in East Asia, points to some very interesting uh, incidents in 1930s China, which is very much related to propaganda war and others. So I'll not elaborate further. I just give the floor to Dr. O'Connor. And may I uh, request the organizers to make him uh, host so that he can share his powerpoints sure so i have already made him okay host. okay yes okay dr o'connor you can go go ahead thank you um okay so i've clicked share screen um and now i'm hoping that you can see my screen um and i will just want to do the full screen um which i uh, God, um, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, are we all are we all clear on that now? Yes, yes. Okay, everybody can see it. All right. So, um, what I'm trying to do is draw your attention to an Achilles' heel in internationalism, which is that no nation um, can afford, for many reasons, um, to accept a challenge to its national integrity. Um, and that many, most nations, um, by their own idea of their identity um, and their integrity, um, paint themselves into a corner, intellectually, culturally, historically, uh, in their foundation. Just as Pakistan under, under, under Jinnah painted itself into an Islamic corner, um, and uh, and therefore a challenge to its to its uh, identity by by um, East Pakistan or Bangladesh um, would have been a challenge. So Japan painted painted itself into a corner um, through its propaganda. Um, so that's why this is about credibility, Shinrai Sek, um, national integrity, and war um, in East Asia. Um, so. We have systems and networks, and this is what I've been studying uh, for a while now, different systems of the English language newspapers um, in East Asia. And you can see here the Japan advertiser Gormindang uh, press network, um, you know, featuring Zhang Jiezi um, and all the newspapers, most of them American um, or connected with America, United States that supported him. Um, and here we have another press network, which is the, um, sorry, I have to go back. Um, the key point is that in the East Asian networks of the English language press, nationalist China's compradors of information, that's what I refer to these newspapers as, um, jostled for credibility. So they're jostling for Shinrai Se um, with the Communist Party of China and their common enemy, Japan, for the just war trophy. In other words, is this war justified? Is this war correct? Are we on the right side? Um, and meanwhile, Japan's dedicated propaganda bureaus from the Gaimusho Johobu to the Naikaku Joho Inkai um, broadcast um, uh, to the West and the British world and domestically. And you can see all these different uh, newspapers going right through Southeast Asia um, and, you know, um, also broadcasting to, to, to the West, and they're broadcasting certain images. Um, 
the British world re received them, the West would receive them, and uh, people of Southeast Asia would receive them. Um, this is a map um, taken from the lining of a mail of a mail letter um, of the uh, of a contemporary mail letter with all the titles of these different newspapers showing all over the place, um, showing from as we can see from Tokyo through Manchukuo, um, Japan's colony in China, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, and New Guinea. Um, but as you can see here, a rather optimistic view of Japan's attack on the west coast of the United States. Um, um, it didn't quite come off, and on Australia. So these were some of the images that they were bombarding, that Japan was bombarding the world with, um, images of, of, of patriotism, images of our little brother in brothers in East Asia. Um, that's, that's China there. Um, images of um, images of motherhood, um, images of the treacherous foreigner, um, images uh, and there as well, um, and so they were broadcasting uh, text and images, essentially of a civilized, disciplined, disciplined modernizing, traditional, anti-communist state. Um, and here are some of these some of some of these images in in uh, postcards of the time. They were talking. They were showing talking to the Japanese people, um, to young women, children, and industrious mothers. And there you see the Aikoku Fujinkai um, and the Daini Honkokubo Fujinkai, seeing their menfolk, their brothers, their sons, their their husbands, um, off to either suicide or clusters of genocide um, in China. Um, on a redemptive mission alongside their little brothers in the Northeast Asian uh, homeland. So here's China and Japan um, on this side, and here's Korea um, and Japan on this side. And you can see um, the different kanji, naikaku, and so on. So we move on. So kokunai. Um, these images were broadcast extensively um, and effectively um, Japan was telling the world that this was what Japan was. Um, from the foundation of the Gamsho Jehobu uh, in, the, in the Japanese foreign ministry as a dedicated bureau um, in 1921, in preparation for the Washington conference, all the way up to the um, League of Nations, um, not the establishment of the League of Nations, but a series of meetings all the way up to the Lytton report um, at the League of Nations. However, um, finally, by the early 30s, there was increasing doubt about Japan's messages, about the validity of their messages, and at the League of Nations, um, between October 1932 and February 1933, um, the Lytton Report denied Japan, Japan's credibility um, and its sense of victimhood, because it was difficult to be a victim if you were um, fighting uh, a war in another country. Um, just as America found it difficult to, to be a victim after the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, it challenged Japan's national integrity at the League of Nations. Matsuoka Yosuke was true to this theory. Um, he simply could not accept this challenge to their cred credibility and, and national integrity. And he was unable to accept the verdict of the lead or of the League and led Japan's walkout from internationalism. And here, he is actually speaking. I hope this is going to work. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the assembly. Okay, and here we have a parallel, as I say, just a 30 years, 38 years later, Pakistan's Islamic Republic, Shah Sheikh Abdul Rahman, and the Awami League uh, principles of secularity as a threat to West Pakistan's as it was called, uh, national integrity. So move on. Thereafter, as soon as it left the League, um, Japan was able to give, the, give its citizens and the world all sorts of reasons to be nervous, afraid um, of the international system of internationalists, making invidious comparisons to the size of their merchant shipping fleet, and there's Japan's compared to other, the others, and the, the, the size of their um, aircraft, the amount of aircraft they had. In athletics, um, 
I think this is the, the 1936 Olympics, um, but I'm not absolutely sure. They're also comparing um, themselves to other nations and they're, they're the key leaders, the Americans and the British and so on. And there's the Japanese puffing away. Um, there's even, that's probably a symbol of Jesse Owens, but I'm not absolutely sure. And there's the Japanese at the back and the people, there's an old man there extremely uh, disappointed with this performance. So they're saying, look how strong the world is, look how threatening they are, look how weak we are, we've got to rearm, we've got to be strong. Um, here are other images from Portsmouth to Washington. You can see, don't trust the foreigners. Look at this. Uh, beware of Greeks uh, bearing gifts. Beware of beware of the Guomindang um, allied with Uncle Sam. Um, and here, you know, this is what's going to happen to Japan if we allow the foreigner in. Um, you know, so we've got to be on our guard and take care. Um, otherwise we'll be chopped up by a fish. And we mustn't be seduced into diplomacy by the colonized press. Um, um, Amor Eji um, talked about Japan being made into a news colony. So there's Shidehara Kikujo. He thought he could work with the Western press. That's Miles Vaughan of UPI. And there you have a parallel with it um, on the other side with the great, the, the gentle fist and diplomacy and, and so on and so forth. But actually there's a much bigger fist behind. Um, then we get to, we get to um, 1937 and the second Sino-Japanese war where um, um, a Hearst uh, filmmaker, Newsreel Wong, films a father bringing, lifting his baby to safety from between the tracks of Shanghai South Station. This is a famous photograph and it was put into a film called uh, Battle of China. Um, this, the, uh, the, the still from this uh, was seen by an estimated 136 million that October, October 1937 readers, starting with uh, American readers. So um, let's go with that. And there you can see there and, and also finally, and there he is, uh, there's the father of the child moving the baby as far as I know, according to Wong. That's Wong's story, um, Newsreel Wong. Um, there you see the actual still. This is the one that appeared in Time magazine. And here you have the Japan Times um, saying how the, how, how the foreign public are fooled by these photographs and showing the baby, then showing uh, a person said to be Wong. One can't be sure, but, the, but and then there's a child standing up. But that little child standing up is kind of a little bit different from that one. And then, but you can see the reality of the destruction of the Shanghai um, South Station um, there. So there's huge damage. And what happens is um, the images of motherhood, the images of babies, the images of Japan as a caring nation um, are extreme, are, are destroyed. Uh, the damage is done um, and pictures like this are extremely effective. Um, for many reasons. Um, the one parallel would be, for example, Nikut's uh, 1972 photograph of the scream, version of the scream. I call it that because look at the voice here. Look at the mouth here. Bombing babies and roasting children can turn the highest ground into a moral quagmire. You know, you get stuck, a nation gets stuck, it can't get out. Um, it sues, it eventually has to sue for peace, um, just as Pakistan did. So, after Midway in 1942, the Americans rolled back the Japanese Pacific and rolled back all of the images. So there you are, they're pushing all the back and they're sending Japan's master narratives of victimhood, um, caring, um, but also suspicion, scurrying back to the motherland. Um, and there you have um, Japan maintains its national integrity it does not accept the challenge. It goes into war um, and so on and so forth, but at a huge cost, domestic suicide and clusters of foreign genocide. So that's, as I say, where mothers once sent their men off by train, now children carry home their remains. That's the picture from the Dower book, um, Embracing Defeat. Um, the fundamental lesson is, I think probably the two things, the one about national integrity, and this point made by Ernest May, the historian Ernest May in Dorothy Borg's collection um, on Pearl Harbor. 
um, that the opinions of individuals are not necessarily direct functions of the information they receive. In other words, they are emotional opinions. Um, people do not go on the facts and some people talk about alternative facts. And we are in this kind of war, this kind of situation. Uh, we've had four years of that and it's very likely to continue. Thank you, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Connor. And this, this concludes our uh, all presentation, three presentations we have. And now we, there's no question so far directed to Professor O'Connor. So if there is any question, you can still write down and maybe by email we'll be uh, answering. So maybe a short uh, comment from Professor Ohashi. Uh, before we conclude this uh, session. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving me a uh, comment time. Um, you know, we have uh, 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 three uh, presentations. And, um, you know, first, uh, first one and the second one is uh, mass care uh, uh, caused by, uh, um, in, in a broader sense, on people. Uh, of course, Okinawa is not necessary to the Japanese, but, uh, you know, at that time, you know, Okinawa was a part of Japan and the Japanese soldiers uh, largely killed uh, the people of Okinawa uh, Ryukyu. And Jeju is the same, that the same peninsula people, uh, because of this uh, state violence and, and, um, uh, and most uh, happened in a small island. That is why, in a sense, it is uh, it's not easy to you know, uh, shown to the other people. So atrocity can easily take the place. Um, so it is irony, you know. Uh, usually, you know, both island is regarded as most beautiful place in in, in present day Korea and uh, in present day Japan. You know, it's a uh, both island are the two spot, but it, both of them, uh, both of uh, them have very dark history. And uh, the presenter, uh, uh, Gayon Beck, was the initiator of, of a kind of dark tourism in Jeju Island. So that was quite interesting. We, in Japan, we don't have that much kind of clear uh, concept of the dark tourism. And the presentation of Peter O'Connor is uh, quite um, tremendous. I mean, we, I, we want to just uh, uh, laugh at me because I don't know much about history of Okinawa, but the, I didn't know much, this much deep of Japanese uh, propaganda during <laughs> the World War II. Um, quite interesting. And, uh, you know, Japan, anyhow, people, uh, you know, he, the three presentations, we can say that the people are, uh, just the subject of the uh, uh, killing or, or manipulating. It, the people are not the uh, uh, main actor to, to appreciate it, but people are just uh, instrumental uh, or, or objective to, to, to be killed. So this is really, you know, state is more important um, than, than people. So it's a really creative um, 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 very sad situation. We have to always think that people are fast, people are at most. And so state is just uh, one apparatus uh, structure. We have to always think about it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We are, we are almost coming to an end. There's a short question for Professor O'Connor. Are we not still seeing this type of propaganda in favor of war, but more in subliminal way, especially in the West? I believe so, um, and and it is extremely difficult to to detect it. But I do, I, I, but I do think um, the thing that people call uh, um, uh, political correctness, uh, despite many blunders and all, all all sorts of idiocy, is fundamentally a counter move against this against these tendencies, and is bringing a great deal out into an, into the open. Um, people are not afraid to speak up, and uh, as uh, um, as uh, Professor Ohashi has pointed out, people are aware of their power and their importance and the, the value of their voice. Thank you very much. We are now coming to the um, end of our allocated time, and thank you to our distinguished spe speakers and also those who have participated, sparing their time. And with this, we conclude our second session.
Thank you again. Mm-hmm.